Bah, the famous spots of movie history. Hollywood and Vine, Sunset Boulevard. 45th and San Pablo Avenue. 45th and San Pablo Avenue. Tonight, the East Bay in film. In 1914, Charlie Chaplin was making movies near Fremont. The Tramp was shot in Niles? Yes. Wow. He was the pioneer of East Bay filmmaking, but it was only the beginning. On this show, we're going to stay on this side of the bay for a field trip of the East Bay in the movies. We're your gotta get away for the day guide. Your let's try a new place to eat guide. Even your hey, it really happened here guide. We're the tour guide with you in mind. Eye on the bay. Picture this. You're sitting in a movie theater when suddenly your hometown flashes up there on the big screen and a ripple of pride washes through the audience, especially because your town isn't often seen on the silver screen. Now, places like San Francisco have certainly had its share of movie time, but what about towns in the East Bay? Hey, it's happened. The East Bay has its own notable list of movie moments. For instance, the frenetic chase scene in The Matrix Reloaded. They built the freeway at the Naval Air Station in Alameda. But do you recognize the tunnel? Yep, it's the old Webster tube. And that's the focus of tonight's show, a tour of the East Bay in the movies. We'll visit places where some famous scenes were shot, and we'll visit with filmmakers who continue to prove that not all great Hollywood movies are shot in Hollywood. The tour begins in what looks like, in fact, what is just this residential neighborhood in Berkeley. And yet, behind the walls of this kind of anonymous looking building have come some of the most recognizable monsters in Hollywood history. Hollywood, they were made right here. Prehistoric, futuristic, otherworldly, underworldly. The creatures created at Tippett Studios are undoubtedly an eclectic bunch, but they've all become some of the most famous supernatural stars of the silver screen. And they were all born, hatched if you will, from the mind of Phil Tippett. This is the yeah, RoboCop 3, this is a, a jet pack. I mean, I just look at some of the creations and some of the ideas that spring from your brain. You must have some hellacious nightmares. The only nightmares I ever have are about human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Tippett is a master monster maker, a legend in the special effects world known as stop motion animation. Because before the age of CGI, filmmakers moved monsters the old fashioned way, one frame at a time. When I first saw Seven Voyages of Sinbad, there was something ethereal and strange and otherworldly and kind of saw. And from that point, it was just like, Bleh. Uh, that's what I want to do. And so he did. First passionately, and then professionally. We work in the commercial uh, wing, and so that we do like Jolly, Jolly Green Giant, Pillsbury Doughboy. And then came Phil's big break. A guy named George Lucas needed some help with his latest project. George needed more stuff in Star Wars. There was a problem with the cantina scene and he needed more uh, aliens. And we were like kids in a candy store with a, you know, 32-year-old millionaire renegade, you know, filmmaking boss that was going like, yeah, you know, go for it. And, and that kind of just grew into the, you know, Empire Strikes Back, Walkers and Tauntauns and all that stuff. All that stuff indeed. The Star Wars trilogy, Robocop, Jurassic Park, three decades of classics, two Oscars, and countless stories. The scene, Michael Crichton wrote the scene for a brontosaurus. I mean, no, no, you don't want a brontosaurus, you want a brachiosaurus. Why do you want a brachiosaurus? They're a lot bigger. I thought, okay, we'll do that. They'll just be like. Oh, and this, there's at least the famous legend about this. Were, were these actually based on the cranes at the Port of Oakland? Uh, that is a uh, bold-faced urban myth. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it really is. And why has Phil never made the permanent move to LA? I was born here, I was born in Berkeley. You know, up at uh, Herrick. So I was just, you know, I did like seven years in LA, but I was like itching to get out. This is a great lifestyle up here. And it's away from, you know, a lot of the insanity and nonsense. And, and now, even as Phil's team digitally animates the vampires for the Twilight movies, Phil keeps a whole movie set devoted to his original passion, traditional stop motion animation. The project I, I'm doing is called Mad God. And so we have Mad God, God Club meets, you know, sometimes at break time or at lunch or on the weekends. And so we shoot 
little sections of this thing and are building it back up. So it'll probably take me another 20 years to get finished it. Now, Tippett Studio is here on 10th Street, and this street is kind of the Hollywood of Berkeley because it was down on this corner, out in the street, that back in the late 60s, Creedence Clearwater Revival recorded some of their early hits right here at Fantasy Records. The man who produced those early Creedence hits was named Saul Zantz. And after he finished with Creedence by the mid-70s, he went off to a smashing career in Hollywood. All he needed for a big hit in the film industry was a room full of crazy people. Peculiar. 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 <laughs> no doubt the folks at Fantasy wanted their first film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, to be a hit. But nobody could have predicted the cinematic stratospheres of success that it had reached. The low-budget production with its newcomer lead, Jack Nicholson, opened in just four theaters, but it blew up from there. And in 1976, it became just the second film to sweep the Oscars. Post-production here at Zanz has quieted down since, but this does stand as a pillar in the house of proof that you don't need to be in Hollywood to make a great film. And there is further proof nearby at the Cal Berkeley campus. We're at the campus because of two famous instances in movie making history. One of them true, one of them false. It's up to you to decide which is which. And the first has to do with that building. Instance number one, South Hall, the oldest building on campus. This was built in 1873. And every autumn, proud campus tour guides will point out that in the film Mary Poppins, some of the famous chimney sweep dancing scenes were actually filmed on the roof of this building. Instance number two, does this archway ring a bell? Does it bring to mind a milestone 1967 movie? Maybe if we played a key bit of music. And here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. True or false, part of the film The Graduate was filmed on the campus of UC Berkeley. Okay, those are the two scenarios. Now, here are the answers. Mary Poppins dancing on campus? This film fact is false. Mary Poppins was shot entirely at Disney Studios in Los Angeles. Which means it is true that parts of The Graduate were filmed here on the campus at UC Berkeley, even though they didn't have permission. They simply snuck a camera in one day with a very long lens on it and shot a few scenes without telling anybody. One other Bay Area connection, Catherine Ross plays Elaine Robinson in the movie, Walnut Creek native. Just to think she was here. <laughs> nice. When we come back, what do Oakland's Claremont Hotel and Robin Williams have in common? Plus, the new face of East Bay Cinema, behind the doors at Pixar Studios in Emeryville. And then we'll head south of here to Niles, where Charlie Chaplin's past is still alive and well today. Welcome back to Eye in the Bay. I'm Brian Hackney as we continue to visit the scenes of some famous Hollywood films not shot in Hollywood. That's right, a lot of classic films were shot right here in the East Bay. For instance, remember the famous pool scene from Mrs. Doubtfire? It's where Robin Williams is trying to keep his family away from the stunningly good-looking Pierce Brosnan. It was shot right here at the Claremont Hotel in Berkeley. And there's more. There's another East Bay studio making huge films these days. How huge exactly? Try $602 million average gross per film. Far more than any Hollywood studio. Now, they've won 24 Oscars, but I will guarantee you, you will never meet any of the stars. That's because this studio is Pixar Animation Studios. Now, when word got out through the Eye on the Bay penthouse that we might actually be interviewing the director of Toy Story 3, Liam Maclin got wind of it. And of course, if it's somebody famous, I'm not doing the interview, oh no. Oh no, ladies and gentlemen, Liam Maclin and the director of Toy Story 3. Ah, uh, Brian, thank you very much. And I am in here at the very creative belly of the beast here at Pixar. I want to introduce you to not just a director, but an Oscar nominated director, 
The movie is Toy Story 3, and by now he may well have the Oscar in his hand. Uh, Lee Unkridge, director, grand to see you, my friend. Yeah, How great are you? to see you. I'm awesome. It's been a great day. As we stroll along here, just being in these creative, hallowed halls of Pixar. There's such a buzz and energy here. What's it about for you working here? It's amazing. I, I've been so lucky to be here for like 16 years now. And the energy and the vibe at the company has stayed the same that whole time. It's a company full of overachievers, really. People working really hard to try to make good movies. Everyone here is so passionate about what they do. And you can see that in the finished films. Pixar is so much a part of the Hollywood story, just regards box office and the fact that you've made more than six billion dollars which is just outstanding and yet in so many ways Pixar couldn't be further away from Hollywood because it literally is. And I think it's part of our success to be honest is that we have kind of a, a different perspective on all of this than people working down in LA. I go home at the end of the day and my neighbors don't all work in the film industry. When I go out to dinner at night my waiter doesn't try to slip me a headshot. You know, it's, we're very grounded up here and we're leading very normal, average lives. And uh, I think that has a way of permeating itself into the movies that we make. And how has living in the Bay Area, Lee, uh, perhaps allowed you to sort of take things from it for some of your films? Has it influenced your choices uh, in any way? Or are there any little nods to the Bay Area that maybe folks may not know about? Well, I mean, we've certainly had a lot of nods to, to Pixar and where we started. You know, we, Pixar was originally in this little town called Point Richmond. That's right. Uh, just yeah. down the freeway. And uh, we've had a lot of references to our humble beginnings in, in some of our films. But at the end of the day, I mean, we live in such a beautiful place. And that beauty has to make its way into the movies on some level. And I think it does. Thanks very much. Thank you. All Good right. talking to you. Brian, uh, it's back to you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your road trip. Could you just say roll tape right there for me, Lee? Roll tape. When you start to dig, there's movie history everywhere. Even Auto Mall Parkway in Fremont. This empty field was once a racetrack called the Fremont Raceway. And here's a little known trivia. They shot these racing scenes from the American Graffiti sequel here in 1979. Good history, which is exactly what the track became when it closed for good in 1988. <laughs> Coming up, why the town of Niles loves Charlie Chaplin, the East Bay's first mega movie star, next. Welcome back to Eye in the Bay. I'm Brian Hackney, and the focus of tonight's show is to point out that not all big Hollywood films come out of Hollywood. Some of the greatest films ever done were actually shot not just in the Bay Area, but in the East Bay Area. And one of the titans of the film industry 100 years ago may not have been a local very long, but while he was here, he did some of the greatest work Hollywood's ever seen. And he did it without saying a word. The East Bay's first major movie moment happened in 1912 when the SNA Film Manufacturing Company moved to Niles. What did SNA stand for? Uh, it was the uh, initials of the two owners, George Spohr and Gilbert Anderson, S and A. The main ship studio was in Chicago, and Anderson came west looking for the right weather and scenery to shoot his westerns. And uh, uh, he was the first motion picture movie cowboy star. Uh, he was known as Bronco Billy Anderson. Why not? Uh -huh. um, it was the scenery. The real buzz began, though, when Bronco Billy brought his latest star to Niles, an English actor with a signature style. New comedian who was rapidly becoming popular in a series of Keystone comedies. His name was Charles Chaplin. Where did Charlie Chaplin live when he was in Niles, do we know? According to uh, his autobiography, he was offered a place at Anderson's bungalow. The tin houses that were built for cast and crew people, all 10 of those still survive as and how many films did Chaplin make when he was here? Uh, he only made five films while he was in Niles. You can't swing a cane around Niles without hitting a Charlie Chaplin tchotchke. Many of them housed here at the Silent Film Museum where you can watch quiet classics every Saturday night. But all of this Charlie Chaplin legacy gets even more impressive when you learn how long he was actually here. He was only here for a little less than three months. 
That's right. After just three months, the little tramp lit out for the big lights of L.A., leaving behind a small town that's still starstruck. He filmed one of his most famous silent films. What was that film? That was The Tramp. And if you want to check out one of those silent films yourself, log onto our website for the details. And don't forget to friend us on Facebook. Kind of makes you feel proud to be part of Bay Area film heritage. It's not all happening in Hollywood, you know. Right outside of Niles. I'm Brian Hackney. Really appreciate you watching. See you next time.